Hey students, it's time to take your game to the next level. We're going to talk about superior strategy. After today's lesson, you're not going to look at the game of chess the same way. We're going to start transforming the way you understand and play chess. If we do this right, you're going to start becoming a more technical and strategic player, and you're going to start experiencing what it feels like to defeat someone without them knowing why they lost. You're going to start experiencing what it feels like to win a game without any apparent material advantage without any apparent checkmate threat, you're just going to win the game because you outplayed your opponent strategically. And trust me guys, at that point, you're going to enjoy the game to a different level. At this point in the course, you're going to be one of two players. Either you think of the knight and you think of a fork, so that's what you've been using your knight for only, or you're a little bit more experienced and you think of the knight and you think of a fork, but you also understand that knights like to be in the center, they like to be in an outpost. But that's not enough. The basics of what we're going to cover today is that concept of, of the outpost. So I want you to understand that. And we're going to do that through a game that I played and I'm going to share with you. Because even though we're going to be focusing on the knight, through this game, I'm going to give you a lot of strategic and technical ideas that you need to understand in order to become a better player. But here's the thing guys, even people who understand what an outpost is and they know that the knight needs to, to get there, they have a long way to go. So this is what we're going to do. After today's lesson, you're going to be able to identify an outpost. You're going to know how to secure that outpost because many people know what it is, but they don't know how to secure it. They don't know how to create an outpost out of thin air. So I'm going to show you my game and I'm going to show you exercises taken from games of the best players in the world, such as Bodminik or Smyslov. And we're going to learn how to create these outposts. We're going to learn how to identify them and secure them. But we're also going to know how to get there. Many people don't really have what it takes to get your knight to the outpost. But even more important than that, we need to know what to do once we get the knight there. I've seen many of my students that they play in the games, they understand this concept, they put the knight in the best position the knight could ever be, but they don't know what to do next. It's like, okay, I got the knight here, what do I do next? And that's the thing that the fact that you put the knight in the best position it can be, that's not enough to win the game. You need to know what to do after. And that's exactly what you're going to learn in this class among many other things. So again, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to show you a game that I played. Then we're going to do like three or four exercises taken from games of the best players in the world throughout history. But even if you don't get it right, even if you don't get those exercises, those exercises are going to help you consolidate everything. And trust me, after today's lesson, your game is going to be different, but we're also going to continue working on it. Just like we did with tactics, we need to repeat and repeat and keep reinforcing it and keep practicing until these patterns become second nature. So with that said, let's get to it. In this game, I was playing the white pieces and I started with the move knight to f3. So right off the bat, guys, you're going to start learning new things with this, with this game. Notice that I didn't do um, e4 or d4. And after I show you the next few moves, I'm going to tell you why I'm using this, this opening. So my opponent did pawn to d5. I did g3. You're familiar with the fianchero by now. And then bishop g2. And finally, I castled. So notice that I already developed my minor pieces on the king's side. I castled. And now I'm going to continue with the game. But before I do that, let me tell you why I chose this opening. And this is something that I do often. And the reason is, guys, that if you play e4, you need to know how to play against so many different openings. They could play the Scandinavian, they could play the Sicilian, they could play the French, they could play the Carocan. And all of those lines, they involve a lot of theory that if you don't know it, you could get in trouble. Not because your opponent is a better player, but because they know the opening better. So you do have to learn all of this theory. And I did. I did take the time to learn all of this theory with e4, with d4. But for the most part, I just play systems like this one that I'm playing in this game because that allows me to bring my opponents into my territory. So they don't really know what I'm playing here and I do know my plans and what I'm supposed to do. It is true that you don't get a lot of advantage out of the opening, but the point of the opening is to get to the middle game safely. Then you're going to outplay your opponent like I did in this game. I was able to outplay him because I knew more middle game strategy, middle game tactics than he did. So in case you're interested in this opening, you're going to see that I'm going to transpose into a King's Indian attack. That's the name of it. This used to be one of Bobby Fischer's favorite systems. So I play many other openings, but this is one that I definitely use a lot. 
So D3, you learned in our last lesson that we are okay with allowing our opponents to control the center because we're going to strike the center when we are ready. So after they castled, I went knight b to d2. I'm developing this knight and I'm getting ready to push to e4 and strike the center, similar to what we did in the check perk with the black pieces. So after knight b to d2, c5, look, full control of the center. And now it's my time to strike with e4. And this is officially, guys, the king's Indian attack. You could start the king's Indian attack by playing e4 first. That's, that's going to be your first move. And then d3 and you get to this position. But I like to start this way for the reasons that I explained earlier. So after e4, my opponent has to make a decision. Is he going to take? Is he going to let me take? So in this game he took, I took with my pawn, and then he went knight to c6. And at this point in the game, guys, this is move number eight. We're going to start talking more about strategy and technical play. So the moment I see this knight here, you're going to see that my next move was pawn to c3. Now, pawn to c3 allowed me to do a few things. Number one is keeping that knight away from d4. It is also obstructing this diagonal from the bishop because that bishop with the finchetto could be really dangerous. So by creating this pawn chain, that bishop becomes less effective. However, I'm also creating a weakness, and this is going to be in part the main focus of our lesson today. If you pay attention to this square on d3, after I push the pawn to c3, there's no pawn that could ever protect it, and that's what we call a weak square. Just like you have weak pawns, pawns are cannot be defended by his friends, by his other pawns, we have weak squares. And some people call this a hole in your position. And this could potentially be an outpost for your opponent's knight. So the black pieces might be thinking of placing one of their pieces here. It doesn't have to be the knight. The knight is very nice to have it uh, here, but it could be any other piece. Like right now, if the queen comes to d3, I don't have any pawns to kick her out. I'm, I might have to do a few things before I could get her out. So that's what a weak square is. And potentially, they're going to be outputs for your opponent's pieces. Now, when that happens, you have to make sure that you keep the bishop that controls those squares. So this is a light square. I want to make sure that I don't trade this bishop off. And as you can see, guys, we're talking already about trading pieces. So this is another big component of your game. At this point, many of you are just trading pieces because you feel like it, because you enjoy trading pieces. But from now on, you're going to pay close attention before you trade any of your pieces. After c3, my opponent went queen to c7. I went queen to c2, so the queen came over to protect that weak square. Plus, I need to develop my queen. Now, bishop g4, and pay attention to this move, guys. This bishop is the light square bishop. If they trade that bishop, his light squares are going to start getting weaker and weaker. So I went pawn to h3. I don't like that bishop there, and I'm asking him, are you going to stay, are you going to take, or are you going to go away? So he took. And at this point, when I took back, first of all, I'm opening my bishop, so it's time to get him out. I'm improving my knight, but I'm also getting rid of that bishop finally. And after his next move, guys, pawn to e5, I knew that I had this game won. I knew exactly what to do, I knew my plan. And if you want, you could pause the video, see if you can come up with your next move, if you can come up with a plan. So the first question that I have for you is, do you see any weak squares in your opponent's territory? So pause the video if you need to and try to find weak squares. Don't forget, weak squares are squares that cannot be defended by a pawn. They cannot be defended by one of your opponent's pawns. So at this point, if you found d6, that's good. If you found d5, even better. So these two are weak squares, but the difference is that this is going to be my outpost because that square is protected by a pawn. So an outpost for your knight is going to be a square that is weak and it is a square where the knight can be defended, ideally by a pawn. And the best thing about this square, guys, is that not only can it not be defended by another pawn, the bishop that is supposed to take care of that is also gone. That's why I was saying before that the light squares are weak. So now immediately I know that I want to put my knight there, but there is another thing. At this point, the bishop is gone, but this knight is defending it. So I identified the potential outpost, but then I have to see which of the other pieces could take care of it because ideally I want my knight to get there and I want him to stay. So I already see that this knight is the only one controlling it and this is perfect because I have to develop my dark square bishop and he's the one that is going to go after that knight. So again guys I'm not just trading pieces because I feel like it, I'm doing it because I have a plan. I want to eliminate the knight 
so that my knight could get to d5. Now, my opponent, even though this is a very strong player, he just went to h6, he's helping me do what I want to do. So I took, and he took back. Now, the next step is to get my knight from f3 to d5. So pause the video again, guys, and I know this is not as fun, but try to find the route for the knight to get from f3 to d5. So you want to get from here to here in the least amount of moves possible. Now, this is what you do. If you already found it excellent, but if you haven't, this is what I do when I want to get to a specific square. So I do it backwards. So I want to go here. What square do I need to be on in order to get here? Well, I look at the safe ones and e3 is one of them. So I have to be on e3 in order to get to d5. Now, how do I get to e3? Well, to get to e3, I need to be on c4 or g4. So how do I get to any of those two? If I want to get to g4, well, I could go knight h2, knight g4, e3, d5. If I wanted to get to c4 in order to go to e3, I could go knight d2, knight c4, knight e3. And then from there, I go to d5. And that's exactly what it did, guys. So notice how I went knight to d2. My opponent is going bishop e7. I go knight to c4. Look, another light square. If this bishop was here, it wasn't so easy for me to go here or even here in order to get to e3 and d5. So knight to c4, then f6, knight to e3. So there was nothing he could do to prevent me from going to d5. Now guys, I know that you might be thinking, okay, but wait, wait, you're not supposed to move the same piece over and over and over, but hey, this is already the middle game. We have a very concrete plan, so it makes a lot of sense. Many times when people tell me, oh, I don't know what to do, sometimes we are playing games and they're like, oh, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do in this position. I always tell them the same thing. Whenever you don't know what to do, ask yourself, which of your pieces can you improve? And that's exactly what I'm doing. My knight is being improved from f3 to a square in the middle of the, of the board defended by a pawn. So after knight e3, they went rook a to d8. It only makes sense to come to the open file, but now knight to d5. So this rook came here for nothing because my knight is blocking that file. And now this knight is really powerful. And to make it even better for me, I'm coming in with a tempo. I'm hitting the queen, which gives me another move. Now, after I put the knight on d5, guys, let's say, before I do anything else, let's say that they had done something like, um, I don't know, bishop d8. This is this are just maybe bad move, but just to show you my point. Let's say I go knight e3, they go knight e7 just to control that square with the knight. Well, since I can get rid of that knight, I might still just go to d5. Why? I'm still getting a very good outpost for the knight, but then if he takes, the supporter of the knight, my pawn, is going to take back, and he's going to become what kind of pawn? That's going to be a pass pawn. And even better, I, I might be able to make it a protected pass pawn. I just wanted to say that because maybe you were asking what if he the knight comes and protects uh, d5. So anyways, going back to the game, I went knight c4, knight e3, knight d5. He had to move the queen, so he went queen c8. And now this is the next stage, guys. I already identified the, the outpost. I was able to secure it. I was able to put my knight there, but then what do I do? Well, now you have to attack. You have your knight there. He's going to help you attack. And it's very important that you understand that you have to pay attention to the squares that this knight is controlling. And I'm not even going to talk today about corresponding squares because I don't want to confuse you. We're going to talk about that later. But here I'm already paying attention to all of these squares that the knight is attacking. If I want to attack on the king side, meaning on this side of the board, I'm going to pay attention to this, this, and this. Maybe I could do something like pawn f4. My knight is helping me, so I need to use what he has to offer. But not only that, when the knight is in the center, he's able to go to either side easily, quickly. So I'm going to be bringing my pieces to attack that king because I'm going to have the help of that knight. That knight has a base of operations in the center of the board. So my next move was queen to e2. I'm trying to bring my queen to the king side. So just definitely better over here. So the next step is to activate the rest of my pieces in order to attack. Then king g7. So he knows this was weak and my queen could sooner or later get there. So king g7, I'm bringing my other rook, so there's no rush. He's not doing anything, he has no plans. I'm just maximizing the power of my pieces. Then rook f7, and then here's my next move, guys. Pawn to h4. So 
the question for you is, why do you think I did that move? What is the idea behind it? Well, there, there were two ideas. Number one, I'm trying to go to h5 and maybe create some weaknesses on around the king. But more importantly, and the main objective of this move is to improve my bishop. Remember, I want to look at my pieces. I see that my bishop is in the fianchetto, but he's blocked by this pawn. So I want to look for a better diagonal. And this one is a very nice diagonal for my bishop. So I'm doing h4. Then after h5, you see, he paid attention to my uh, initial attempt, and he thought that was all I wanted. So he blocked it, but now I'm going to, to improve my bishop. I cannot just put it there. He's going to take me, but that's why I did king h2. Now I'm going to h3 no matter what. And again, since he doesn't have a light square bishop, once I get there, that's going to be my diagonal. So after bishop f8, bishop h3, and I'm claiming that diagonal. The queen needs to move. And before we get to the next move, guys, you might also be asking, okay, why is this guy doing so many bad moves? He's just going back with the bishop. Well, put yourself in black's position here. There's nothing you can do, actually. This knight is giving you such a hard time. And honestly, I think he's doing bishop e7 to bring uh, the knight to e7. So he's going to try to get rid of my knight. But this is exactly what I meant at the beginning. I'm not ahead in material, I'm not threatening checkmate, but my opponent knows he's lost. It's just very uncomfortable to play here. And I know it because I have been on the other side too. I've been there trying to fight versus a, a strong knight in the center. So after bishop a3, he moved the queen, and now there is a very strong move, guys. So pause the video again, see if you can find the next move that I did. Well, this move is very easy, and the move is bishop e6. I'm attacking that rook, and anywhere the rook goes, guys, I'm going to be attacking it with my bishop or with my knight. So just like that, since I activated my minor pieces, I'm going to get one of his rooks. If you compare this knight to this knight, this bishop to this bishop, you have to agree that my pieces are way better. So he went rook e7 because he wants to lose the rook to my knight. That's the one that he wants gone. So even if it's at the cost of the rook. So I went ahead and took it. My, that rook is better than my knight. Now I'm mapping material only because of the pressure that I put with my knight and my bishop. So another thing here, I'm already winning and I'm pretty sure we have talked about this already a few times, but there's a rule that I follow when I'm winning in material. Number one, if I could attack the king, I'm going to go and attack him because I have better pieces to attack than he has to defend with. But for the most part, I just like to simplify the game. If I get rid of the rook for this rook, the bishop for this bishop, the queen for this queen, I'm going to be left with a rook versus a knight, and that's going to be very easy to finish. My rook is going to go to get those pawns, and the knight is going to have a hard time to do anything. So right now, I'm going to simplify the game. Then here, to be honest, guys, I think the best move was to bring the other rook to the open file with a tempo. But... I fell in love with the outpost, so I put my bishop there now. So that square has been used by all of my minor pieces. So after bishop d5, he went queen b6, bishop b3. Now I realized that I could use this diagonal to attack the king. So if my queen goes there, that's going to be a battery and I could get to, to g8. So again, the light squares, you see? So that bishop that they traded a long time ago in, on f3 happened to be very necessary at this point. So bishop b3, my bishop went from this diagonal to this diagonal. So I was able to improve it successfully. So knight a5, he's trying to get my bishop. I'm going back to the outpost. This is another idea that I think you're going to appreciate. And is this, anytime I can put my bishop two squares away from the knight, from a knight, any knight, I'm going to do it because that's the best way for the bishop to control the knight. So any square that the knight is going to go to, my bishop is going to be controlling it. It doesn't prove to be very useful here, but if this knight didn't have all of these pieces to help him out, my bishop would be keeping him there without him being able to, to get out. So always keep this in mind. So bishop d5, queen c7. Now my rook is being improved. Knight goes back to c6, queen d3. So another battery on the open file. When I move this bishop, I'm going to be able to go to the seventh rank. So I'm ready now to take, simplifying the game, and go to the seventh rank. So he went away, he knew it. Now bishop b3, the same plan to go here and attack the king. b6, queen d5, 
trying to go to g8 on, or f7. He's trying to go away, but it doesn't really matter to me, guys. I'm getting close to that king. Now, after pawn to g5, this is another opportunity for you to pause the video and see if you can find the strongest move. Well, here is all about threatening checkmate. The queen is here, she needs a helper, and my bishop is going to, again, travel through the light squares and it's going to threaten checkmate on g6. And at this point, guys, they gave up. There's nothing they could do to stop the checkmate on g6. So before we go into the exercises that I mentioned before, I know I gave you a lot of information, but there's something that I have to make sure that you actually got from this game. You have to know what an outpost is. You need to know what you're supposed to do once you identify it, which is eliminating any pieces that could defend that. So you have to make sure that you leave your, your opponent with pieces that are not able to control that weak square. And then once you get the knight on that outpost, you need to use his help to attack. Okay guys, I hope you're not tired yet because now we're going to go into the most important part of the lesson. So if you need to, go drink some water, take a break, come back, but it's important that you finish this from beginning to end. Just looking at what I showed you is not enough. You have to actually make sure that you practice the same patterns over and over and over until you get the hang of it. And another thing guys is, I said already, I'm going to keep working on this, reinforcing it, even if I talk about other topics, whenever I have the opportunity to talk about this, I'm going to point it out. So it is important that you follow this course. Uh, please take the time to just subscribe. I think you can just click here and you subscribe. That way you get notifications for fusion lessons. This is a process, so it is important that you follow it and you do it the right way. All right, guys, so here's the first exercise. So this is from a game played by Smyslov. This is one of the best players from the Soviet Union. And here it is the white pieces to move. And I want to know if you can come up with the right plan. I'm not talking about the next move only. I'm talking about the right plan. So first, see if you can identify the weak square in the black's territory. So what square is it that cannot be defended by any of the black pawns? So that's the first question. Second. How can I get rid of the pieces defending it? There's no pawn defending it, but what if I could get rid of the only pieces that could defend it? And third, you have to know how to get your knight to that outpost. So I'm gonna go over it now, guys. So if you already have it, great. If you don't, pause the video and try to come up with the answer to these questions. So number one, what is the weak square? What is the potential outpost? Well, that's going to be d5. And if you remember from the lesson we had on backward pawns, this is already a backward pawn, and you learned that always the square in front of a backward pawn is going to be a weak square. So this is going to be my weak square, but right now we have the light square bishop on the board and we have a knight that could protect. So the first move should be easy. There's an easy way to get rid of the bishop, and that's exactly what Smyslov did. He went bishop takes bishop because we know that with that bishop gone, this square is going to be even weaker. So guys, now you're not trading pieces just for no reason. You're trading it with an objective. So the black pieces took, and now how do we go after the other defender of d5? Well, that's pretty easy as well. Bishop g5, and after they went rook e8 to protect the bishop, because that's another thing, they cannot even move the knight away. So after they protected, we eliminate that knight, and just like that, guys, we left our opponent with the worst piece they could have, this bishop that is blocked by his own pawns, and our knight cannot be removed from d5. Now, we already talked about the rule of simplification, and here's another way to think about it. It's not only about what you're going to capture, you could also think of the pieces that you're leaving on the board. So once you trade pieces, what pieces are remaining on the board? Are they good pieces? Are they bad pieces? Like in this case, the white pieces traded um, these two bishops, which are good bishops, look at this bishop. But it's not about what you're trading, it's about what's going to be left on the board. So what they did is they left a very good knight versus a very bad bishop. So again, guys, going back, we already identified the outpost, we got rid of the defenders, and now we're going to place the knight there. So in this case, we didn't have to maneuver the knight around, we just went to d5. Once we get the knight there, we need to use it to attack, and you're going to see how Smyslov puts that into practice. So here, the black pieces went bishop d8, but if they had taken on c2, this knight is already going to create a fork. So you're going to go rook f2, making the queen go away. If the queen goes, let's say, a4, there's a fork. If the queen goes to c6, then rook c1, I'm attacking the queen, 
and supporting the knight on c7. So now when they move, you go knight c7 and that's a fork. So in this game, of course, they did not take on c2. They went bishop d8, trying to improve the bishop. And that's another thing, guys. Sometimes you happen to be the one on the other side. You're the one with a bad bishop. So you have to look for ways to improve the bishop. This bishop is doing nothing here. Well, I'm going to try to put it on this diagonal. So bishop d8, now pawn to c3, pawn to b5, b3. So we're going to get the queen out of here. And we don't really mind that this pawn is a little bit weak because this knight cannot be removed. He's going to be here for as long as you want, protecting that pawn. So now they put us in check. We're going to keep it simple and move out of the way. So rook c8, rook f3. Guys, this is what we call a rook lift. So rook lift, rook rollover. So in this case, you already know that once you have the knight, you cannot just have it there. That's not enough to win the game. We need to attack and we're going to attack the king. Now, as we go through this part of the game, I want you to pay attention to the squares that the knight is attacking because we're going to focus on that. This move to f6 could come at the right time because the knight is helping us. So right now, rook f3, we do it because of the following reason. We know that rooks like to attack through open or semi-open files, but we don't have any. So if I put the rook here, I can't attack. There's one of my own pawns in the way. So faster than just trying to remove this pawn is going to be to put the rook in front of the pawn. So I cannot get him out of the way. I'm going to get in front of him and I'm going to be attacking. So rook f3, that's the point for it. Many people think it's just to defend. No, it's just to bring it over and attack the king. So king h8 is getting out of the way. Then f6. You see, we're coming in just to open up the king. We don't care about that pawn. If he gets taken, we're not even planning to take it back right now. We just want to open up the king. So they took. Now, I'm not going to take and give up my knight so soon. I'm going to bring more pieces. Look, the queen is ready to put pressure. Rook g8. Now the knight takes, and he's helping us do checkmate on h7. So after rook g7, rook g3, trying to deflect the rook. If the rook takes, guys, we have checkmate in one move. So they went bishop f6, taking the knight. He was just getting too powerful. And after we take, we're pinning the rook, and we're threatening checkmate in one move. So rook g8. And now look at this. We have queen and rook. He's defending pretty well so far, but we need to bring more pieces. And what is the only piece that we haven't used? The other rook. So this rook is coming now to d1. Now I'm threatening to take on d6. So he went pawn to d5. We took first, and now rook d5. Attacking the queen, and I'm going to d8 to do checkmate. So queen f8, rook d8 anyways, pinning the queen. And at this point, the black piece is resigned. I'm getting the queen for free. If they take, I'm going to take back. And now this is going to be a very easy game to finish. So guys, this part I showed it to you just for you to appreciate how he used the power of the knight to aid the attack on the king. So this was the first exercise. Let's go on to the next one. All right, guys, so here we have this exercise and then one more. We only have two more to go. And the reason why I'm showing you these two is because in this one, you're going to see the same thing we've been working on so far. But on top of that, after the knight gets to the outpost safely, you're going to see it putting even more pressure after he gets to that outpost and giving its opponent a really hard time. And the last one is going to be an exercise where they actually create an outpost that was not even there. They just created it out of thin air. And that's another skill that you really have to have. In this position is the white pieces to move. Take a few minutes to think about it and see if you can come up with the right plan. So again, I'm looking for that potential outpost. So try to identify it. Second, try to identify the pieces that might give you a hard time when you get there. And third, we need to find a way to get there quickly and efficiently. And then of course, after that, we're going to attack once we have the knight on that outpost. So I trust you guys post a video and you try to do it yourself. Here, this is the plan. I want to eliminate the bishop, I want to eliminate the knight, and I want to get my knight there quickly. But this one is a little bit different. I have to make sure that I do all of this quickly enough. My knight is a little bit in trouble here, he's hanging. So how do I get to do that quickly before he can actually prevent me from going after this knight and so on? Well, the first move here, and by the way guys, if you're thinking of knight d6, 
that's just losing. You're getting yourself pinned, it's not a good move. But then here's the thing, many of you maybe thought of the move bishop takes bishop, we're getting rid of that bishop, but here's the problem, if you just take and the queen takes, then this guy's being attacked, you need to find a way to put him in safety, and that's just going to be too slow. So how do I save this knight before I even take the bishop? I need to save the knight with a tempo. If the queen happens to be here after the queen takes my bishop, I won't have that tempo, but I have it right now. So the move is actually knight to c3, I'm hitting the queen, so this bishop is going nowhere, and once they move the, the queen, then I go, I follow through with my plan, which is bishop c4, and then bishop g5 pinning the knight. So queen e6 happened in this game, they didn't even delay it for too long, they just took the knight, and now look at this, knight versus bad bishop, and my knight has a very nice outpost on d5. So the queen goes to h4, and now you're going to see guys how they use this powerful knight to finish the game. And again, pay attention to the squares that the knight is controlling, okay? So they went queen e2, then bishop f8, and now queen f1. Look at this maneuver guys, so the queen is going to e2, then to f1. Now why did they do it? Well now when they go to g3, this queen doesn't have h3, so the queen is almost trapped, and after queen g5, they went pawn h4, so look at this, the knight is not letting the queen go to f6, to e7, to e3, so that queen is now on a very awkward position, and the knight is controlling the queen very efficiently. And also, this queen here could at any moment come over to the king's side to attack, or to the queen's side if it's necessary. So, queen h6 now, then pawn to g4, we're going after the king, but also after the queen. So, g5, pawn takes, queen takes, and now rook h5. So now my pieces are going to start putting pressure on the king because not only is he open, we have this knight able to aid the attack. So queen g6, now pay attention to this. He had to move the queen. He doesn't have any other squares other than g6, but now it has to light up in your head. This knight could go to e7 and create a very powerful fork. The only problem is the bishop. So I'm already thinking, huh, what if I could deflect that bishop? What if I could make it away? You cannot do it right now, but it's good that you have it at the back of your head. So now look at this beautiful move, pawn to g5. Now it looks like we're just dropping the, the rook, so we're bringing support to the knight. So you see he's going from outpost to outpost with the help of the pawn. And it looks like we're just dropping the, the rook, but if they did, our knight is going to create another fork. So you see that knight not only, not only is he on a good spot, but he's putting a lot of pressure without actually moving. He's just threatening to go there. So pawn to g5, h6, rook takes. Look at that powerful move. Again, the bishop cannot take because we have a fork with the knight. And this is what we talked about before. So if you keep this at the back of your head, sooner or later, you could use it to your advantage. So the bishop cannot take, they took on g5. And now rook h5 again, offering the, the rook for free because we have the fork. The queen had to go back, and now finally we bring our queen. So we have a battery, getting ready to go to h8, and we're also getting ready to pin the queen. So guys, notice how inevitably we have to talk about tactics sooner or later, but these tactics are only possible because we have our pieces well placed. Our strategic plan led us to a very comfortable position to capitalize and win the game. So queen e6, and now see if you can find checkmate into moves forced. Well, the checkmate is going to be queen h8 check, and then queen h7 checkmate, because again, the knight was helping from d5. So this is, I think, a, a perfect example of how the knight can be such a powerful piece once he is in the center. All right, last exercise. Um, I know this has been tiring. It's not as exciting as playing games or, or doing tactics, but you really have to do this, guys. So I'm going to show you the last one because, like I said before, in this game, you're going to see how Botvinnik, he actually finds a way to create an outpost out of thin air. So far, you've seen outposts that are already there for you, or they have been easy to create. But this one, it was actually created out of nothing. And at this point, I wanted to ask you, do you see any potential outpost? Well, the answer, guys, should be no. There's no potential outpost for us right now. And that's why I think this is such a valuable game, because you're going to see how Botvinnik actually found a very clever way to, to get it. So after pawn to a3, 
which by the way is to control b4. We don't want any of these pieces on b4. And we're also planning to go pawn to b4 ourselves in order to get this bishop from here. So knight f6 and pawn to b4. Bishop has to retreat. And now look at this move, knight to d4. Believe it or not, this is the most powerful move in this game. Now, why is that? Well, by doing this move, not only is our knight going to the center from where he could go to other uh, key squares, but he's challenging the light square bishop. And we know now that after they take, the light squares in his territory are going to be weaker, especially that square that is not defended or cannot be defended by another pawn, c6. So the pawn from the d file is gone, the pawn from the b file is already pushed, so c6 cannot be defended by another pawn, and the bishop that was supposed to take care of it is gone. So that's going to be, guys, our outpost. There's a lot of work to be done yet. We need to secure it. So if I ask you, what is your plan to secure the square? Well, you should be thinking of your pieces, of the pieces that you have that could control it. So we have this rook that could go to the open file. We have this pawn that could cement the knight once he gets there. So after queen c7, queen b3, rook f to c8. So everyone is fighting now for the open file. Rook f to c1. Now, since the queen is there, we come in with a tempo, we're claiming the open file. Now check, queen f3, so look at this. If we understand the concept of the weak square, we understand that if this queen is gone, then that's it. The queen is the one now in charge of replacing the light square bishop. So if we get rid of the queen, that square is going to be even weaker. And guys, and I don't know about you, but I really enjoy seeing how the whole game is decided on a specific square. It's not even about winning a piece. It's not about attacking the king. It's just one tiny square that if you control it, is going to lead you to a better game. After knight d5, e4, so he goes back to where he came from, and now b5. So we know what that is for. The knight is going to c6. So a6, trying to get rid of that uh, pawn, because we know he's going to offer us that support. So knight c6 with the tempo. So I'm pretty sure you thought of the move pawn a4, bringing more support. But hey, let me just put the knight there with the tempo. That's like an in-between move. He doesn't have the time to take me because I'm hitting the bishop. So bishop e7, and now pawn to a4. Now, if you evaluate this position, guys, look at that knight. He's better than any of the black's minor pieces. So pawn takes, pawn takes, rook takes, we take back, and now we get the open file. And that's very important. Whenever you have this tension on an open file, you have to avoid trading the rooks because then you're giving up the open file. He's going to retake, and now he's the one in control. So rook a8, trying to get it back, and rook to d1. So we're trying to keep a rook, guys because we need pieces to attack along with the help of the knight. So knight e8, knight c4, knight c5, pawn to e5, what is that for? Well, not only are we opening this diagonal, but this pawn is bringing support to another weak square. So rook c8, rook a1, going to the open file again. Since this rook already left, we're going to try to use it to get to a7. Now they have to be very careful with a move like rook to a8 because they lose material. If they did that, you're going to do rook takes, and when the queen takes, this queen is going to be hanging on the same diagonal as my queen. So we could do check, discovered attack on the queen. So of course they did not do that, they went rook c7, but now rook a7 thanks to our strong knight on c6. So they gave up the queen, then knight takes on b6, we got a pass pawn, we have way more material, and the black pieces just gave up. So again, guys, this is a game that feel free to go back a little and understand how he created that weak square. So I know it's been a really long lesson, but we needed to do it this way. You have to understand how to capitalize on these little things. And trust me, if we keep working on it, we do it the right way, you're going to learn how to capitalize and win games in a magical way. So stay tuned and I'll see you next time.